Hi everyone and welcome to another episode. Today we're going to be going through some tips and tricks on your 3018 Pro, so let's get stuck in. So most people who buy a 3018 Pro are often at the start of a CNC journey. And much like myself a few months ago, you spend that much time just learning how to use the machine. You don't always know the tips and tricks to make life easier. And that's what we're going to go through today. We're going to look a little bit at maintenance of the machine and keeping it running as smooth as possible. We're going to look at different ways of holding material down to the bed. We're going to talk a little bit about aids that help when cutting. We're also going to touch on setup and calibration just to make sure you're getting the most out of your machine. I'll put time codes below in the description just in case you want to skip ahead to any particular section. But what we're going to start with is sound and vibration. Now for such a small machine, one of the biggest complaints is often how noisy it is. And the majority of that noise is down to the vibration. So we can look at a few different ways to try and control this. One of the first options is simply to enclose the machine and that physically reduces the amount of noise you're hearing. Now I built an enclosure behind me. There'll be a link up in the corner with the uh, plans if you want to download and build your own. But I've seen more creative ways of doing this, simply putting clear container boxes over the top. Obviously that helps reduce the noise and contains the dust and is a much cheaper and easier option. So don't always think you've got to go down the route of building a full enclosure. Now, the other two options is we can either look to reduce the amount of vibration off the machine is transferring through to work surfaces, or we can look to reduce the amount of vibration in the machine itself by tweaking a few things. And to do that, we'll take a closer look at the machine now. So we've briefly spoke about containing the noise within an enclosure, but that's not always practical for everyone because they can be quite big and cumbersome. It's also not addressing the source of the noise, which is the vibration. Now, one of the vibrations is the machine itself shaking on the workbench or the surface it's sitting on. So let's take a look at that. Simple solution is to use furniture pads. These can be sourced quite cheaply in most DIY stores. You can also cut them up to different sizes, make them as thick or as thin as needed. You can buy more expensive versions of these, but to be honest, the cheap ones do just the same job for the purpose that we're using. You also then need to look at the machine itself and its movement. Now in an ideal world, you want to fix the machine down to a solid surface such as a workbench, but that's not always practical for everyone. So an alternative solution that I've seen is to fix the, fix the machine to a solid piece of MDF or plywood like this in the background. What that means is if you leave a bit of overhang on each side, you can clamp that down to the, to the workbench itself rather than having to clamp the machine. You want to avoid applying clamps on the machine itself because you run the risk of twisting the bed. What we're also not addressing at the minute is the source of the vibration and that's what we'll look at now. Obviously all this comes from the spindle. These things spin at anything from 7000 RPM up to 20,000 RPM if you've got an upgraded one. And any slight imbalance within this setup will just add to the vibration that's going on there. So let's take a look at the different components. You've got the ER11 chuck, you've got the collet and the nut itself, and then you have the bit that you're using to cut. Now, all these components have a different degree of tolerance. And although this is meant to sit quite snugly onto the center of the spindle, there will be a slight degree of movement. And if you tighten one side more than the other, then it will just offset it in one direction. So it's worth actually trying to count the amount of turns you do on each side to keep it as balanced as possible. You then have the nut and the collet. Now I did an experiment a couple of weeks ago where I took off my old collet nut and replaced it with a new one. There was a seven decibel difference in the readout with the old one being louder. Now I'm not sure if the old one was just off balance to begin with or whether it's worn down over time. Either way, it made quite a bit of difference. Also your cutting bits. Now typically these are brought in cheap off places like Amazon or eBay. And if you imagine it only has to be a fraction off center and as that spins round, it's just another imbalance in this setup. Now we are talking fractions of imbalance here, but when you add them all together, they can just multiply. And if they sit on one particular side, it's just going to cause more vibrations in everything. Let's also look at the spindle itself. So this is an example of a typical stock spindle that most people get. Now you'll notice that on the bar, 
one side has been milled flat. And this is to allow the chuck to clamp to it better rather than trying to clamp to a rounded edge. But if you think about it, what that does, it actually makes the spindle itself off balance because it's missing a part of the material. I didn't realize how much of a difference this made until I found a spindle that had a full stem. Now, when you take into consideration the difference in the spindle there, the new collet I put on with the collet nut, there was nearly a 25 decibel difference in the amount of noise from my old spindle to the new one. So all these factors combined really do make a big difference in the amount of vibration and sound that you're getting from the machine. So whilst we're on the subject of vibration, I just want to point something out to you. As you can see around these two bearings, there's a grey substance and this is two part epoxy resin that I had to put in place to hold the bearings in. I had quite a bad spindle on that shook it so bad all of the bearings came out of place and I needed something to hold them in. Now there's a bit of a debate as to what's the best method to hold them in, either epoxy resin or a grub screw. Personally for me, if you put a grub screw in here, it can potentially distort the bearings, so I went with epoxy resin. The downside to this is it means you can't remove the bearings easily afterwards. So it's something to bear in mind. But I just wanted to highlight this because you need to keep an eye on the bearings to make sure that they're sitting in the housing. Because as soon as they start to come out that can cause some serious damage. So moving on from vibration and noise but not too far. Have you ever noticed that when you move the X, Y and Z axis sometimes there's a bit of a high pitched squeak? Well that's come from friction. Now when these machines arrive from the manufacturer they typically arrive dry and what that means is there's no lubrication and this is where the maintenance schedule starts to come into play. So these machines have lots of components that constantly rub on each other such as the linear rails and the bearings and when metal rubs upon metal one you get the noise but you also get friction which generates heat and that's bad for the metal because eventually whichever is the softer of the two will start to wear down over time. Now you may not notice any difference instantly, but eventually maybe the bed becomes a bit loose or there's a bit more play in one of the axes. Or in a worst case scenario, a bearing could fail, causing a jam and possibly even a crack. And that pretty much ruins your machine. So we need to apply lubricant to keep everything running more smoothly. And this is probably one of the big things that they don't often tell you when you get the machine. So when you start talking about lubricant, people often think oil or grease. Now in most case scenarios that is correct but in a machine that generates dust something like grease is a bad lubricant because the grease clings to the dust and will then start to churn that back into the bearings causing them to clog up and jam. So it's actually probably a bad lubricant to use on these machines. What we need to do is look at something called dry lubricant or PTFE lubricant. Now this is quite clever because it allows minimal friction between the metal but it also stops dirt from clinging to it so it's quite a clean lubricant to use. I use two different types on my machine. I use this one by Muckoff and this is a slightly thicker consistency and at the end of the night when I clean the machine down, and I'll talk more about that in a second, I apply a thin layer of this to all the different rails and axes and just work it in a little bit. Now I also use a second one which is by Poutaline. The reason I use a second one is this is a thinner consistency. It's also an aerosol and it's got this great spray nozzle. Now if you're doing a long job, maybe four, five, six hours, even longer as some of you out there do, you want to keep the machine lubricated whilst it's running. And trying to get into the tight spots with something like this can be really difficult. You can end up causing, like, causing it to jam, miss some steps, and that will ruin your job. Whereas something like this, you can spray them from a distance at tighter angles. So you can keep the machine lubricated whilst it's running. So I just touched on maintenance. And what I like to do at the end of every night once I've been cutting is give everything a good clean down. So what I'll do is get the vacuum out and I'll get something like a little paintbrush. And I'll get into all the tight spots and get as much dust out as possible. Because the least amount of dust that's in there, the better it will run and it stops causing as many issues. I'll also give everything a wipe down. So even though we're using a much cleaner lubricant, you can still get a buildup of lubricant and dirty lubricant, so such as I'm showing you now. But what you want to do is give this a wipe down every couple of days and just make sure it's clean and not building up. And once you've wiped all the old lubricant off, you can then put a new coating of fresh lubricant on. The other thing I also do is go around and check all of the connections. And this is something that's really important. So anyone who follows me on Instagram may have seen a few weeks ago, I had a bit of an accident with the machine, which caused the spindle to blow and the board, and it cost quite a bit to replace them. 
Now I'm pretty sure the reason that happened is one of these connections actually came loose. It reduced the amount of power going to the spindle and that's why it jammed. So it's really important to go around and check all these connections, not only at the end of the day, but also before you start a new job, just to make sure that there is no issues and you're minimizing as much potential for things to go wrong as possible. Now, as well as maintenance, what can you do to help keep the machine clean? Well, one of the more obvious things is to minimize the amount of dust actually coming off your machine. And that's where accessories like this dust boot starts to come into play. And we'll move on to accessories now. So one of the first accessories I got for my machine was a dust shoe. Now the way these work is you connect your vacuum to them and it just allows the dust to be extracted right from where the tip is cutting and it keeps everything much cleaner and stops it throwing as much dust into the air. The design of them is typically quite simple. If you've got a 3D printer they can be found on Thingiverse. If not they can be purchased from elsewhere online. They simply click onto your carriage, you connect your vacuum to it and then as it moves across, obviously the vacuum moves with it and therefore extracts all the dust and keep everything nice and tidy. Now this is great if you're doing short jobs, but if you're doing long jobs then you don't really want to keep your vacuum running for three or four hours. So what you can do is use a light timer switch with them. And this just can set your vacuum to come on maybe every 10 to 15 minutes and clear some of the dust up. Obviously it's not going to be as efficient as keeping it on permanently, but it will just help to keep things tidy. Now the second accessory that I brought is cable protectors. With your X and Y axis on these motors, this is less relevant because they are static. However, on your Z axis and the power supply for the spindle, this is constantly moving back and forth. And therefore it runs the chance of the wires rubbing on the gantry. So you just want to give protection to these because otherwise they will eventually start to wear down or they can get caught on something else and potentially ruin a job, even ruin some parts on the machine. Now this is quite a simple one. It is just plastic spiral and you can pick these up from places like Amazon and eBay. They're also quite cheap. If you want something more complex, you can buy fully 3D printed systems that sit up here and they're like a roller track that just winds back and forth as the machine does. Now the next accessory is a Z-Probe. What a Z-Probe for is for setting your Z-axis to the perfect height of your material. Rather than doing it by eye or trying to slide a piece of paper in there, you're telling the machine the exact measurements of it. Now you can buy these pre-built, but they can also be made for a very small amount of money. You're literally talking a couple of wires, two crocodile clips, and a scrap piece of metal. Now, all you need to know is the thickness of that metal for it to work, and then you program that into something like Candle or UGS. And the way it works is you will set the Z probe off, it will come down, and once it touches the metal plate and it will come back up, it will know to add on the thickness of that plate to the measurement. So for ease, let's say that metal plate is 2 mil, it will come down, take that reading, come back up, it knows to add 2 mil to it, and it comes back down and it will sit on the top of your material perfectly. Now this is great, one if you're doing repetitive cuts, but also if you need to change the bit over during a cut. So for example, if you're doing a clearance cut with something like a flat end mill, and then you need to switch to something like a tapered ball nose, what's in at the moment, it's just an easy way to guarantee you get the Z height the same for both cuts. So two very common accessories that I've not mentioned is the offline controller, and limit switches. Now one of the reasons I don't have an offline controller is because I've always got my PC permanently connected to my machine. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have them sitting together right behind me. Now an offline controller is great if for example you have a laptop and you don't want to leave your laptop permanently connected to the machine because you need to take it elsewhere or if you have something like a desktop that sits in a different room or a different building. You can simply load the program onto a memory card, put that into the offline controller and set the machine running. So it requires less resource to actually keep the machine going. Now, there are some limitations to the offline controllers. One, they only have a small screen. I like to be able to see the visualizer in UGS and actually watch everything running. Um, the other limitation is they don't work great with Z probes. So from what I understand, you either have to make some modifications or every time you export the code, you have to put an extra piece of code in there to get it to activate the Z probe. And that's just one thing that I'm not interested in doing. The other accessory that I just mentioned is limit switches. 
Now what limit switches do is it basically tells your operating program that that's as far as the carriage will go. So for example on the x-axis as it comes over it will hit a limit switch and say don't go any further and it, you'll have one on either side just to make sure it doesn't drive the motor too far and you know get that jamming noise that you often get. Now you typically fit them on every axis on both sides. So you'd have two for the x-axis, two for the z-axis and two for the y-axis. Now one of the downsides to the limit switches you do lose a bit of cutting area. There is no way to avoid this. So for example if your x-axis is a 300mm cutting area when you fit a limit switch to either side they may be anything between 5 and 10 mil. So then you have to minus that width off your cutting distance. So in a worst case scenario, a 300 mil x-axis would come down to something like 280 mil. So that is one of the downsides to them. But they are great if you're using something like light burn for doing laser work. The way light burn works is it wants to touch every side of every axis to know where your bed and your homing area is and then what it can do it will know that this position down here is the start position or that position is the furthest position away. So they just help to home things in but again they're not essential and it's one accessory that I don't have and if I'm honest I don't plan on buying one anytime soon because there are ways to work without them. Now we've gone through accessories let's take a look at the bed and have a look at different ways that we can fix material down to it. So let's start to look at ways we can mount onto the bed itself. Now typically these are the type of clamps that you will receive with your kit. It's just a normal bolt that goes into the bed. If you're fortunate enough to have the ones that come with a T-bolt, great, they grip much better. But if you just have these we can make a quick upgrade straight away to make life easier. We'll swap out what is a normal bolt with a coach bolt. The reason for this is when your normal bolt is in these slots, they spin around quite easily, making it difficult to tighten them up. A coach bolt has this squared section on the bottom and that sits within the grooves and it means you can turn the butterfly nut and tighten it up much easier. And that's exactly what I've done on my own, on my own clamps, is replace them all with coach bolts. The other complaint you often hear people make about these type of clamps is that they don't feel they're that good. But I've used them for quite a while and I've been pretty happy with them. They grip the wood really well. But I think what often is the fault is the way people are using them. As they're tightening the butterfly nut up, the plate starts to come up this way. If you imagine that's the piece of wood there, the pressures are being applied down, but because it's at that angle, it's also pushing the wood away at the same time. And I'll show you an example of this now. So if we bring this in and just try and quickly clamp it down, but with an upward angle as just mentioned, I don't know if the camera picks that up, but that's at a slight upward angle. And what it means is that this can actually move pretty easy and be pulled out. Now if we do it the other way and have the plate facing down, it changes the pressure and the way it's applied to the wood. Now again, I don't know if the camera picks it up, but that's just above level, so the front is actually pointing down into the wood. And that makes it much more difficult to move the wood. It can be moved, but it takes a lot of extra pressure. What you can also do, if you're worried about damaging the wood from where these sit in, you can use some of the felt pads that we discussed earlier on the corners, and just put a small one of those on, and that will just soften the, any marks that it's gonna make on the wood. Now, an alternative method to mount into the bed is to use what's called CA glue or aerosol activated glue, along with something such as masking tape or blue painter's tape. And I'll show you an example of how to do this now. So off camera, what I've simply done is put a piece of blue tape onto the bed. I've also put a piece of blue tape onto the wood itself. We then take the glue and we just apply a small amount to the blue tape on here. We take the activator spray and we put a coating of that onto the other piece of blue tape and then simply stick them down to each other. Now you do have a second or two before this set in case you need to position it and try and get it perfectly aligned for something, but it does only take a few seconds for it to set and this is why it's one of our favorite ways of holding material down. 
that should do it and the wood is set the only movement there is the actual movement within the bed itself a few advantages to using this method firstly you'll notice that there's no clamps clamps can often get in the way of when you're cutting because knowing that head is moving around you run the risk of it potentially hitting that it also means that if you're using the full you will need to use the full width of the piece of wood you're cutting you can do because it can go edge to edge and this is especially brilliant when you're trying to use the maximum bed space that you can you can stick a full piece of wood on there it will be held down solid and there is no need to worry about having to get clamps on there or again the head hitting those clamps when you're done and obviously once the machine has finished milling everything that it needs to because it's only held down by painters tape you just simply need to peel one side of it up and it should just lift off the bed there we are we'll see you just peel the tape off together you can grip it it leaves no damage it leaves no marks there is a little bit of a mark there and on the bed, but that's just the overspray of the activator and that will fade in time. And it also means there's no damage to the wood of typically what you might get with using clamps. So as I say, using blue tape and CA glue is definitely my favorite method for holding things down. It's probably also my favorite tip I found out since using my 3018 Pro. It's simple, it's quick, it's easy. And it also means you can use the maximum amount of space of the piece of wood you're putting on the bed, or even the maximum amount of space you've got available on your bed because you don't have to worry about clamps around the edge. Now just going back to clamps for a second, if you're fortunate enough to have a 3D printer, there are lots of variations of things you can print to hold things down, like different step wedges in order to hold different types of material down. They're all available on Thingiverse. Unfortunately, like me, not everyone has one. There is one other method I'm just going to quickly touch on for holding things down, and this is called an MFT style worktop. I'm just going to put a picture in the corner so you can see for reference. But what this basically is, is a, a top that sits on top of your bed with lots of holes in. And you can put pins in this hole to be able to clamp things against horizontally, and that means the pressure is going horizontally rather than holding things down vertically. There are some advantages to them. One, you can adjust the pins about to hold different shapes and size material quite easily. And you can also change things on them quite easily because you just flip the clamp off, change the material out and flip the clamp back on. There are some downsides to using them though. One, the base is typically quite thick, maybe up to an inch. So you start to lose some height on where you're actually cutting. Also, because of the way they work and they have to have a clamping mechanism and an edge, something to hold on to around the edge, you start to lose space of your cutting bed. So it's brilliant if you've got small things to cut regularly and you want to change them out quickly. But other than that, there's not a great deal of advantages to using them. So the last thing I want to talk to you about is setup and calibration. Now typically your machine arrives, you build it, connect it to your PC, and you just get going. You don't even think about editing the GRBL settings unless there's a problem. Because well, to most of us, all those dollar signs and numbers can be quite scary if we don't know what they mean. Now just to give you a bit of background, GRBL is used to run much bigger machines than this with heavier spindles. So what they do by default is keep the settings on the control board quite low for safety reasons. It doesn't know that this is a lightweight machine with a lightweight spindle. What that does mean for us is we can go into those settings, start doing some calibration tests, pumping the numbers up and getting the machine running faster, smoother and better. Now there's a company called Saint Smart Jimitsu and they're one of the top manufacturers of the 3018 Pro. They've got a user group over on Facebook and in that user group is a man called Graham Bland. He's honestly a genius with these machines. He spends a lot of time helping people out, including personally solving some of the issues I've had with my machine. He's also wrote a series of guides directed at beginners, such as myself and you guys. And in these guides, he talks about these different settings, how to do the calibration tests, and to really get the most out of your machine. He's also been kind enough to allow me to share these guides directly with you. In the description below is a link to all these guides. There'll be some PDFs and some test files in there, so you can go through, start calibrating your machine, and get the most out of yours as well. Now the reason I'm only talking about them is because there's quite a lot of content in there and various tests to do. So I'm going to save that for another episode where we'll run through calibrating your machine from start to finish. But just to give you a bit of a taster, when I fitted the new control board to my machine a couple of weeks back, 
Here is the x-axis traversing at the standard settings. Now here is the x-axis traversing again after doing ground calibration tests. Now straight away you can see not only does it run faster, it also accelerates to that top speed much faster. And that's just one setting. Imagine when you start applying all those settings to the different axes, you're just going to get a machine that's really dialed in and working perfectly for you. Now that's everything in today's episode. Thank you very much for watching. If there's any tips and tricks you want to share with me, because I'm still a beginner at the end of the day, please let me know in the comments section below. I love talking to you all. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. And I'll see you all on the next one.